Joseph Smith, Murdoch Smith, and Julia Murdoch Smith. Uh, they were suffering from measles because of being uh, left alone and the difficulties of that night. Complications set in, particularly in the case of young Joseph. And the result will be that a few days after the tar and feathering of the prophet, Joseph Smith, Murdoch Smith, was dead. What is so poignant about the situation is not only do you get him buried, but Joseph then needed to leave uh, immediately to go to Missouri as the mobs wanted him dead. So Joseph will leave. He will be chased. He will then write back from Cincinnati, Ohio, a letter to Emma indicating that if she wished to save her life and that of her daughter Julia, that she needed to now move both of them to Kirtland. Joseph Smith was a remarkable leader. He forgave others, and even though as a result of this event he suffered the death of his first son, he was still willing to forgive, and yet this did not deter his desire to restore the fullness of the gospel to bless the lives the people that he loved. Fearing for his safety, Joseph stayed in Missouri for a brief time. When he returned to Ohio, he did not go back to Hiram. Instead, he moved his family to Kirtland, where they found shelter and safety in the upstairs level of Newell K. Whitney's general store. Here, Joseph administered the affairs of the church, translated the Bible, and continued to receive revelations from God. In the early 1830s, uh, probably around 1832, the church started to experience the, the fact that there were two church centers. Joseph was usually and primarily in Kirtland, but down in Missouri, where it had been revealed that Jackson County, Missouri would be the place of Zion, there were leaders sent to take care of specific things needed. During the latter part of 1832, there were some ill feelings between the brethren in Missouri and the brethren in Kirtland. To resolve that, uh, Joseph Smith sent a letter to W.W. Phelps in January of 1833. Included in that letter was a revelation known as the olive leaf. And then Joseph Smith said, plucked from the tree of paradise. Joseph hoped that revelation would soothe some of the ill feelings the Missouri brethren had for the Kirtland leaders. I send you the olive leaf, which we have plucked from the tree of paradise, the Lord's message of peace to us. For though our brethren in Zion indulge in feelings towards us, which are not according to the requirements of the new covenant, yet we have the satisfaction of knowing that the Lord approves of us, and has accepted us, and established his name in Kirtland for the salvation of the nations. The brethren in Kirtland pray for you unceasingly, for knowing the terrors of the Lord, they greatly fear for you. You get the sense that Joseph intended it to be evidence, again, reproving to the brethren in Missouri that he was the prophet, still receiving revelation for the church. And section 88 is so full of profound and sublime revelation that it would be hard to deny that he was a prophet after reading it. Included in the revelation was the command to build the Kirtland Temple. The saints in Missouri had some feeling of, you might even say, some elitist feeling that they were where the temple would be built. But Joseph reminds the saints in the letter, pointing out in the doctrine of section 88, that a temple would be built in Kirtland, Ohio, and that that would be a place of a temple also. Organize yourselves. Prepare every needful thing and establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. Section 88 was meant to secure Joseph's standing as a prophet. Uh, it tended to come to him at a time where he was uh, probably feeling some antagonism by at least some of his colleagues and friends who had been called to preside. And it's interesting that the Lord often comforted Joseph with deep and sublime doctrine. It did have its desired effect on the saints in Missouri. There was a, uh, the, the, the revolt or the, the antagonism he was feeling from them dissipated. And for a season there was great peace and the growth of the church in both Kirtland and in Missouri 
uh, was uh, maintained. There were some neat things happening in Kirtland, obviously, and that's where Joseph's, uh, that's where Joseph was, was kind of overseeing some things. But his mind and the minds of a lot of other saints were actually spending a lot of time 900 miles to the west in Jackson County, Missouri. Uh, remember that back in 1831, Joseph and others had located the site for the city of Zion. They had dedicated a temple lot there. They were in kind of a tough spot there. There were some major differences between the Mormons and the Missourians in Jackson County. One of the fundamental differences was that Missouri was a slave state. Uh, ever since it had been founded, slavery had been legal in Missouri and there were a lot of slaves there. Mormons, most of them coming from New England and the Northeast, were not slaveholders and to one degree or another opposed slavery. The Mormons also, of course, uh, were basically a political threat to these Jackson County settlers. And by 1833, over 1,200 Mormons had settled in the county. The county consisted at that time probably of only about 3,300 uh, total. And so the Mormons themselves made up roughly a third of the county population. Mormons also had their own press. This was the only press in the county uh, owned by the church, of course, operated by W.W. W. Phelps, with assistance, of course, from Oliver Cowdery and others. And you can imagine people reading the newspaper and then uh, turning over the page and reading one of Joseph Smith's revelations. Uh, that wouldn't go over some of the local ministers who are trying, of course, to uh, spare their flock from the Mormon influence. The Mormons also, of course, uh, had a belief in the uh, destiny of the American Indian. And back in those days, that did not set very well for uh, Americans on the western frontier as well. So all of these things combined to cause problems between Mormons and their Missouri neighbors. The Lord had told the saints that Jackson County would be the site of the New Jerusalem. In one of the revelations Joseph had received, the Lord talked about the glory that would be coming upon Zion, how neat of a place it would be, it would be a place of peace and safety and refuge, and only the righteous would be there. And then he closes this revelation by saying, now keep these things from going abroad until it is wisdom in me. By coming down there, some of them boasted concerning the fact that they believed God had given them this land, that this was to be theirs and their inheritance, and that uh, it would only be a matter of time before the other Jackson County citizens would have to be removed or join the Mormons. That probably did not set well with most of the native inhabitants, you might say. Then at the same time this is happening, they misread an article that W.W. W. Phelps had written in the church newspaper. They interpreted the article to mean that the church's plan was through missionary work to convert free blacks back east and invite them out to Missouri to settle with the rest of the Latter-day Saints in Jackson County. All of the tension between the Mormons and their Jackson County neighbors uh, came to a head on July 20th, 1833. On that day, a mob consisting, most reports say, between four and five hundred men, which is very considerable, uh, came and of course approached Edward Partridge, the Mormon leader in Jackson County, and demanded five ultimatums. Uh, reviewing those ultimatums, uh, Partridge said, there's no way. Uh, there's, how, how can we sign anything to this effect? He said, give us three months to talk this over. And uh, so they could communicate with Joseph Smith concerning some of these problems they were having. They said, no, you have 15 minutes. And Partridge refused to sign. The mob reassembled back at the courthouse and then came together and went down to the printing operation in W.W. Phelps' home. And there they ransacked the home, threw the press out the window, which was located on the second story. Edward Partridge, he and Charles Allen were tarred and feathered. Three days after these tarring and featherings, on the 23rd of July, the mob reconvenes. This was according to previous appointment. And again, they begin threatening the saints. At this point, several church leaders step forward and offer their lives, literally their lives, 
kill us, just leave, leave the rest of the Latter-day Saints alone. And the mob refuses to do that. They don't want just a couple of lives, they want the Latter-day Saints